Hello, everyone, and welcome to this edition of The Master of Money. I'm Steve Beaming, your host, and whether you're joining us live here in our facility for the Master of Money Meetup Group, or you're joining us around the world through the streamed videos on the internet, we're awfully glad you spend this half hour with us, and we hope that the content we bring you helps you build a better path to prosperity. Now this week, we're gonna be talking about something I've spoken all over the country about, and that's something I've referred to as disruptive technologies. Other people will call these things like exponential technologies. But the idea is that these are technologies that we're experiencing today that are so greatly going to affect our lives that when we look back, we won't even recognize the way we were before. These technologies are with us today, and whether it's in robotics, communication, 3D printing, or automation. It's disrupting the very nature of the economic world. Think about it with me. We went from an agricultural economy into a manufacturing economy, into a service economy, into a technology economy, and now into a pure information economy. The value proposition for labor is changing rapidly. And as you recall last week, I spoke to you about the barbell economy. Well, these disruptive technologies play very clearly into the disruptive or into the barbell economy, and we think it's a driver. So these technologies we're going to talk about we think are critically important for you to have a handle on. So we're going to talk about that as we move forward. Now, last week on the program, we talked about shorting stocks. We talked about two ways to short stocks, or two reasons to. One of them was the surefire way to give Wall Street your money, and that's to take a naked short position, or just short against nothing else. Well, that surefire is a way to lose your money, so we didn't recommend it, but we talked to you about a smart way to short stocks, and that was through a hedging process called either a pairs trade or a market neutral trade. That is surefire a way to generate a return. It may not be as high as a pure buying strategy return, but we showed you that it's much more stable and over a long period of time will lead to a better return because you compound at a better rate over long times. So we hope that you found that program interesting. And of course, we got a lot of questions at questions at savefinancial.org and we welcome you to write them as well. A lot of folks said they were glad we covered that topic, that they weren't familiar with it. Well, we hope that that familiarity now, which is yours, can help you as you either manage your own assets or as you talk to advisors who manage your assets. Make sure you consider the idea of market neutral strategies for your portfolio. Now, we talked last week also about super stock, and this week I've got some exciting news on super stock. We're going to share this with you in the second half, but we think you're going to be very excited about it, especially for members of the meetup groups. We're going to sponsor something coming up that we think you'll find extremely exciting. So we touched on that last week. We also talked more about our Safe Certified program and some of the other programs that the Society is doing for you. Remember, this Society was built for you, and all of the work we do is built to give you a better path to prosperity. Now, we did in our questions last week, we had an awful lot of them that came in about that market neutral concept, but we got one that I pulled out because I've been interviewed on TV an awful lot about this. And the question was, what's going on with the European Central Banks? It came out last week that the European Central Banks are beginning to look at their own quantitative easing program, buying European bonds to put liquidity into the European market. Now the reality is what's happening is because of the oil price decline that you and I have spoken about, the Russian economy is hurting and that's hurting the economy of Europe. They're big exporters into Russia and when the Russian economy slows, so do their exports. That's led Europe into a, well, a slowdown. It's not quite a recession yet, but it certainly is a slowdown. Well, to prevent the recession, the central banks are beginning to put currency into circulation again, hoping to stimulate. Now, if you're thinking as I am, we tried that in this country with our own quantitative easing, one, two, three, and it didn't really stimulate a whole lot. It did protect us, perhaps, from sliding deeply into recession after the um, debacle of 2008, but it didn't really stimulate the economy. 
What stimulated the economy largely is the natural business cycle. So I'm not sure that the European attempt to stimulate their economy is going to really affect how they do. And in fact, in response to that stimulus program, the Swiss actually pulled their franc out of the EU um, money. In other words, they're no longer pegging the Swiss franc to it. So in response to that, the Swiss franc jumped in value to the, e to the European currency, and that's an indication that the Swiss aren't real happy with them printing money to solve their problems. So on a real, real uh, uh, I guess an applicable scale for you, I would say to the person who asked that question, let's look at Europe at the fundamentals. Let's look at the earnings of the nation or of the companies within those countries and translate that into expected returns. In the United States, we're growing at around 3%, maybe 4% in corporate earnings this year. I don't think Europe's gonna do that. So it looks to me like the United States is where you want to put your money today. Now, moving into the geopolitical review, there are a couple things. Obviously, oil is topping the list. We have the Iranian government coming out now saying they'll support oil down to $25 a barrel. Well, that's going to equate to gas prices for you and me well under $2. Not that we would mind seeing that. But this is an indication of a real problem in OPEC. If you go back at the strength of OPEC in the 1970s, the United States and virtually the entire world was dependent on the product they have. We'll roll the clock forward to today. With the fracking processes in the United States and around the world that have flooded the world with supply of oil, the reality is OPEC is losing a lot of its muscle. And you're beginning to see those nations fight amongst themselves. The Iranians maybe can survive a $25 oil or per barrel oil price, but I'm not sure the Venezuelans can, and I'm sure not sure the Russians can. So this was an interesting shot across the bow from the Iranians, being, showing a little bit of belligerence to the Saudis and other members of the OPEC nations. We'll have to see what happens. I'm not sure we're going to see $25. We're at about $46 right now. I think we're stable there and could see it come down a little more. But I think, generally speaking, we're probably where we're going to be for a while, barring any cataclysmic moves by one of these producing countries. We'll have to see what happens. And again, stay tuned to the Master of Money each week, and we'll keep an eye on that with you. The second thing, again, going back to Switzerland, this was big news that the European Union, I talked about this in the member question, the European Union is coming out to do quantitative easing in effect. They're going to buy government bonds in hopes that by adding money into the economy, it stimulates it. Well, the Swiss didn't take very kindly to that. So they took their currency off of a peg to the EU currency and free floated it. In other words, they just took it off of its relationship to the European currency. Well, in a nutshell, what that did is it took the value of the Swiss franc up, the value, relatively speaking, of the European currency went down. And this is where it hurts. If you go into nations like Poland, many of those people have home mortgages that are based on the euro or on the Swiss franc. If you have a mortgage based on the Swiss franc, well, their euros just came way down in value, so their mortgage value just went way up. That's a real problem because you have millions of mortgages whose values just skyrocketed in terms of repayment. We're going to have to see how it plays out. But we've talked about problems in the European Union, you and I, and I think this really does put in place the structure of a major problem. When we look at Greece, and we talked a couple of weeks ago about the fact that the new Greece or Grecian government may go to a far-left socialist group who's threatened not to pay back their debt. Well, that's got the Germans very upset. and They've threatened to kick Greece out of the EU. Well, when you add Switzerland into this and the situations going on in France that just happened, there's a lot of tumultuous times in the European Union. Again, stay tuned to the Master of Money as we monitor this as we go forward in time. Now, finally, there's so much heavy stuff in the geopolitical world, whether we're talking about the new Chinese missile or we're talking about the Russians or these oil problems. I thought I'd give you a little lighter story. may not be so light when you figure it out, but the Miss Universe pageant's going on, and it seems that there was a little spat between Miss Israel and Miss Lebanon. Miss Israel snapped a selfie, and it had them together in the photo. Well, the geopolitical outcry was enormous, with people saying, 
didn't Miss Israel know that she's enemies with Miss Lebanon? Well, we hope that the Miss Universe pageant can maybe bridge that gap a little bit. We don't have to bring geopolitical threats of war into a beauty pageant. So we'll see what happens at the Miss Universe pageant, but those young ladies certainly created a firestorm when they dared to take a picture together. And moving into the economy, December consumer prices were, had fallen for the most in about six years. Now, a lot of that you and I know is driven by gas prices coming down. Virtually everything in the consumer economy is affected by fuel, and that's largely because of shipping costs. So as fuel has come down, so have consumer prices. Again, the most in about six years. But that also talks about December sales figures. If we X out automotive, and the automobile industry had a very big post-Thanksgiving sale period, but if we look at general consumer spending in December, it was a little disappointing. So there was a lot more discounting going on. That all combines with the low oil prices to give us deflation in the month of December. But interestingly, it also, during that time, Gallup took a poll on consumer confidence. And they found, and you can attribute this to gas prices, I think, but they found that consumer confidence is at its highest point since they started taking the poll. They started it in 2008. So we obviously saw it tail down very quickly in 2008 and 9, but it's now come back to a point that it's higher than it's been since they started it. That speaks well of the American consumer's ability to go out and spend a little money where they want. Now gas prices, again, have cut in half, so that's more money in your pocket every week. We also, with that, saw the decline in prices in December, and it's all contributing to a much better confidence on the part of the consumer. That's all good stuff. Now we wait to see if that confidence will sustain in January. Tonight, following the Master of Money program, the President of the United States has chosen to follow me by giving his State of the Union message. We'll just see if that State of the Union doesn't expand or decrease consumer confidence. Finally, um, as I said, we wait with bated breath for the State of the Union message tonight. We've seen the pretext for it, and we know that the President will propose an increase in capital gains. He'll propose free co um, community colleges for everyone. He's going to propose closing tax loopholes on the rich. Now, from a purely economic standpoint, let's not talk politics, let's just talk economics. Raising the capital gains rate today first will never fly in the House and the Senate. And if it did, it could serve to stymie this very softly growing economy, taking money out of the private sector and putting it into the public sector, the government sector, does not stimulate. We're very slowly beginning to come out of the economic problems we had. Raising that kind of tax on capital gains would do nothing to further our growth. That's an opinion of the society based on economics, not based on politics. But we wait next week. We will report to you on what the White House said. We think it'll be interesting. And of course, it's always good, um, I'll say good theater to watch the White House and then the Republican response. So after this program, I'm sure you can flip on any network and watch it. We hope you enjoy it. And I look forward next week to commenting more and more about it. Now in the financial markets, the markets did tail down over the last five days. Of course, they were closed yesterday for Martin Luther King Day, but they came down slightly. And this is all part of wondering what's going to happen in Europe, watching the Chinese economy slow down. People are taking some profits off what they had. But I also think you have a little bit of a preemptive sell based on tonight's State of the Union. I think people are concerned what that might do to the market, so they're doing a little bit of profit taking. And that favorite old uh, little ETF of mine, the VIX, by the way, soared last week up about 20%. That's a pretty good indicator that there's expected volatility to come into the market. So we'll keep an eye on that for you. Now tonight, as I said, we're going to talk about this concept of disruptive technologies. It's hugely important, and you can paint this story one of two ways. I can either paint a story for you that is very frightening on where we're headed, or I can paint the, what I think is the truth, and that's the opportunity that comes up through these technologies. Let's be realistic. We don't need buggy whip manufacturers anymore. But neither do we need automotive factory workers. In fact, automation is taking fast food service over by a storm. The questions are, what do we do as technology replaces labor, and how do you and I make money on it? 
Well, thankfully, there are some real ways you and I can capitalize on this major transition. And tonight, we're going to talk about exactly what you can do to benefit from these massively disruptive technologies. So I want to thank you. And just before, by the way, there's a statistic before we break I want to share with you. This was disconcerting. and It fits up in perhaps the reviews that I do. But I wanted to highlight it because I have a real soft spot in my heart for American small business. I have been an advocate for the small business community and spoken out loudly to chambers of commerce and every other group I can about the benefit of small business on the American economy. Now, since 1945, we have seen a slow decline of the number of small businesses in America. People are migrating from working for the mom and pop shop to the Walmart. That's a natural thing. But for the first time since we've been keeping records, just this last period, in this last quarter, we saw the number of businesses failing and shutting down larger than the number of businesses starting. That's a really dangerous statistic because the miracle of the American economic model was fluidity. You could start with nothing and become a millionaire. Well, the way you did that was through the beginning of a business, whether it was Apple Computer started in Steve Jobs' garage, or it was Thomas Edison in his um, garage building a light bulb. Stories abound of people who started with nothing and then became wealthy. The way they did that was through small business. And what we're finding is that we are regulating and taxing small business out of business. We all understand, for example, in banking, that we need to have regulations. We can't have J.P. Morgan Chase running wild and losing billions of dollars. But what we've done, as a specific example there, is impose regulations on those major banks and also impose them on the small neighborhood bank. Well, the neighborhood banks don't have the money, and as a result, they're shutting down. It's hard-pressed to find a local bank anymore. We need to watch this as we go forward as a nation because without small business, the idea of transitioning through classes from poverty to wealth will go away. So I bring that up to you as a very important data point. And um, it's something that we want to talk about in the context of these disruptive technologies. So stick around. We'll be right back with the continuation of the Master of Money. And as I said, when we come back, we're going to talk to you about disruptive technologies. We'll be right back. Wall Street's quiet this Monday for the holiday, yet your money is still being put into play by those around the world who hold the very essence of your future in their off times, grimy, cash-covered hands. In other words, there is no break from the money and the money master. Bulls, bears, and bucks, let's welcome back from the Society to Advance Financial Education. Steve Beeman joins us, who also does not have the day off because he's looking around at the other side of the world as well, correct? That is a correct statement. Constantly monitoring a 24-7 globe. Always happens. Here we go. Now, I'm looking at three things. Brent crude's below $50 a barrel. The output in Iraq is slowing. China's outlook is slowing. Wait a minute, all of a sudden. Let's stop getting hit from all sides here. Let's take one at a time. The Brent crude below $50, and I'm looking at a report right here that talks about strategists, and you know how well they always get things right, say it'll be $30 a barrel eventually, and that will really create a disaster. What do you think? Well, I would take the 30 with a grain of salt. But as you and I have talked so frequently, this oil de price decline is a double-edged sword. For those of us in America who are the consumers, it's a terrific boom for the consumer economy. But for those economies like the Middle East that are dependent on oil for their entire economy, this is really a blow to them. Most importantly, Venezuela, Russia, those com the countries are really hurting. What about the, the record output of Iraq right now sitting there? Because we've talked about this as well with the crude going here, with the, with the fracking here in America and so much. There's a glut of oil in the world. Are they just going to hoard this? What, what do you think is, the, is the, the future plan here for all this oil they're pumping out? Well, I thought this was interesting. Iran came out very belligerently against its OPEC friends. And I think if we go back to OPEC's power in the 1970s, they really did monopolize world energy resources at that time. So no matter what they did, they worked together. 
Now you're starting to see a fragmentation of OPEC where it's a little bit every man for himself. And Iran has come out very belligerently saying we can run this down to $25 and still survive as an economy without regard for what their neighbors might be able to do. So this could begin to show a bit of a split in OPEC, which would only be a good thing. Is this a power play, you think? And would Iraq have enough on their side to actually create enough of a power play against the Saudis, for instance? It is a power play, but I don't think compared to the Saudis, they really can. I think you've got a situation in Iraq or in Iran, excuse me, where they're running against sanctions from the U.S. and the Western world that are hurting them. They're trying to just throw a little bit of their muscle around saying, hey, pay attention to us or we're going to do this to you. I don't think it's going to hurt Saudi Arabia at all. It's really hurting Venezuela and Russia. Third part of that is down to China because we're showing an 8 percent drop in the stock market here uh, with some irregularities going on. All right. How does that 8 percent drop then eventually work its way over to America? if indeed it does. Well, there's two things, and you and I have spoken on the program about the slowdown in um, the Chinese economy from its really incredible 10% growth rates down to around 7, and that's just a natural slowdown. What happened in the 8% drop is that Chinese regulators went in and reduced some of the leverage that the market makers were using to invest in stocks. That d reduction in leverage caused there to be a sell-off, which is that 8%. I don't think that's going to be material to the U.S. market. This is a technical trade, if, if you will. So I think net-net it's not going to hurt us, but it does portend to show that the Chinese economy is slowing just a little bit. All right, now we had a trade deal working between the European Union and the United States. The free trade agreement has some roadblocks. Again, explain to us here what exactly this is in relation to the American consumer. What does this say about us then? Well, what we're trying to do, Ed, is open up trade on all levels, and most importantly is food. That's a real problem with the Europeans. They don't like our genetically modified food, so they're putting up some serious roadblocks there. But we have to understand the, the European Union in context is really suffering right now. The central bankers of the EU are trying to put out a quantitative easing of their own. Switzerland just pulled the Swiss franc away from the EU currency. So we've got a lot of things going on, and this trade agreement with the United States, because of the food and some of the other very specific industries, they need it to go through worse than ever. So I would assume they'll kind of come around eventually. What is the danger if indeed the EU and the, the ECB starts this qualitative easing? How will that affect the world markets? Well, I had a discussion just yesterday with a friend of mine who's a long-term trader in the markets. He's been around the world quite a you know, few times, and he's looking at this, and I tend to agree that we could see a period of very stagnant economies around the world, very similar to what Japan went through with their lost decade. The European Union central banks are trying to stimulate like we did here in the U.S. by just printing more EUs currency and that's not going to help it's going to just keep things stagnant but you could see a very prolonged period of um i won't say a recession but a kind of a, a stagnation in the european economies and here you people thought that because it was a holiday in america nothing was happening around the world how dare you from the society to advance financial education our friend steve beeman joins us steve always a pleasure my friend thanks so much we'll see you again this week thank you ed all right buddy take care other side of the brief intermission welcome back I hope you enjoyed that brief interview from Newsmax Television. Newsmax is one of the many um, television stations that I'm frequently interviewed by. And as one of the most powerful up and coming stations, I wanted to show you what Ed Berliner's midday program was like. Now, if you get my Twitter feeds, you get my LinkedIn feeds or my Facebook feeds, you'll know when I'm on Newsmax. So I'd urge you to stay in touch. And um, again, once a week I'm on there talking about the issues of the day. So we hope that you'll join us on Newsmax and visit them either through the Dish Network or through, I think it's NewsmaxTV.com. So anyway, I hope you enjoyed that. Travel with me in your mind back to 1981. Ronald Reagan had just been elected president. The Iranian hostages had just been released. And you and I had never heard of personal computers. Microsoft, Apple, the internet, these things never entered our lexicon in that year. But it was in that year that I actually wrote a book, a book called Computers Made Simple, in which I prognosticated about what the world would look like in the year 2000. I spoke of a home wired electronically so that your computer could feed you all of the information you need, stock investing data, company business data, word processing, database management. I spoke about a world in which we'd have automated machines to make our coffee and to make our food. Well, little did I know at the time I wrote it, I hit it dead on. Well, these technologies have greatly come of age and with a speed of increasing that's almost unbelievable. 
It wasn't 10 years ago that smartphone technology didn't even exist. And now billions of people own smartphones, either through Apple iPhone or through the BlackBerry system. The idea of a phone that can carry your internet communications, can carry your ver um, audio communications, video communications, was unheard of just 10 years ago. And now it's a way of the world. So as we roll that clock forward and we begin to look at the impact of these new communication technologies. We see technologies that can't be stopped. I mean, let's take a look at the Arab Spring, a revolution caused by social media. Let's look at the impact <coughs> of everything from manufacturing, where robotics now rule, to self-driving automobiles that are now in production, to 3D printing, where you can technically print a car to drive down the road, or I should say, have you driven down the road? These technologies are disruptive to the way we live. They present perhaps the greatest investment opportunity in history for those of you who have capital to invest. So you want to understand these technologies, have a handle on it, and you want to know how to invest in it. So tonight, I want to look at five specific areas of technology that I believe are going to present the biggest opportunities for you. Number one, we're going to talk about communication and connectivity. We've grown up in a world, I'm 53 years old, so I grew up in a world with a telephone. And it was actually rare to call long distance because it was expensive to use a telephone. Well now, using my smartphone, I can call around the world and it's virtually free. We're seeing communication grow at an exponential rate. But we're also seeing communication between computers improve. And that's the key, and that's what I want to talk about. Secondly, transportation. The ability to get from here to there. The world is becoming an awfully small place, and that means economies will be more linked than ever before, and investment opportunities will be more global than ever before. So number two, we're going to talk about that. Number three, education. I have spoken time and time again and preached till I'm hoarse in the throat about the need we have as a nation and a globe to forward education. Technology makes tech, um, education more feasible and more viable, but it also makes it more necessary. So I'm going to touch on education as our third. Number four is energy. I'll give you an interesting statistic. If we look at the consumer growth from 1965 to 1995, and we try to say what were the drivers, what caused that, one of the primary drivers is that in 1965, the average American family spent 40% of its take-home money on food. So if you made $100 a week, you spent 40 of that on food. That's quite a bit. Well, by 1995, the amount of money the American household spent on food had dropped from 40 to about 10. That difference is what created all the free money for people to spend, and that's what created the consumer boom. That was a productivity miracle in American farming, and we reaped the benefit of it. I believe the next 10, 20 years will have the exact same thing happen in energy costs. Whether we're talking about heating buildings, heating homes, fueling cars, automobiles, jets, the cost of energy will, by its nature, come down significantly over the next 20 years, and that will lead to a resurgence of free capital. And finally, I want to talk about labor. And as I wrote my notes, the big three words I put were, who needs it? We're going to talk about these disruptive technologies, or again, these transformative technologies or exponential technologies, however you want to label them. But I want to talk about what it's going to do to the very nature of how we work, live, and play. So let's start by taking a look at communication and connectivity. Now, when I speak about that, I'm not talking just about picking up a phone and talking to someone. Been there, done that. We can do that easily. In fact, if you travel around the world, I've been in certain countries around the world where they don't even have landline telephones. They live totally on a cellular network because it's less expensive to build. So that cellular vo voice communication is well established and well built around the world. But what I'm referring to is often called ubiquitous computing or ubiquitous communication. The idea that computer chips, the semiconductor that powers your computer, your phone, your TV, that power is coming down so much in cost 
that virtually everything you own will have a semiconductor based processor in it. I'm talking about everything from clothes that can monitor your health and automatically transmit that data to your doctor. I'm talking about telephone technologies that can immediately link bank accounts to anywhere around the world and transfer money at no cost. I'm talking about sophisticated technologies that can actually, in your home, you won't need curtains anymore because your, your windows will be smart windows and they'll know when the sun sets they should darken and not let people look in from the outside. These are technologies that are here today. Everything talking to everything. Cars communicating with the roads they're driven on. Gas stations communicating with your car so that you'll kn the, the idea of running out of gas will become a thing of the past. That technology exists today. It's widely referred to as Bluetooth technology. People use it all the time to connect their phone to their earpiece. The fact is though, that Bluetooth technology connects any computer to any computer. And what we're going to see through that is a communication revolution like we've never seen. The semiconductor companies are making that possible because the cost of those little micro things have come down so significantly that within 10 years, the cost of a semiconductor will be the cost of this piece of paper. So communication, how do you make money on that though? Because what is it, you know, it can be scary, but I would argue that these changes aren't scary, they're opportunity. And I want to talk about that part in just a minute. But secondly, let's talk about transportation. Cheaper fuel means cheaper transportation. Cheaper transportation means more people will do it farther and further distances. So what's going to happen is we're going to have a world that comes together truly as one. Even now, if you're in your high school years and you're using Facebook or Twitter or Instagram or Pinterest, you're talking to people all around the world as if they were your next door neighbor. The concept of society is changing. Like-minded people are coming together in these social media networks that completely transform how societies operate and transportation's the next step in that. There's currently technology in place that will fly you from a breakfast in New York to a lunch in Los Angeles and a dinner in Tokyo. When that kind of transportation technology hits, you'll see this world become much more integrated. Global opportunities will abound. But there's more to it. If we look beyond just cost and efficiencies, let's consider things like self-driving automobiles. They exist. I just bought a, a new car this last May. I'm willing to bet you that it's the last car I buy that I actually drive. Self-driving cars exist today, and within five, 10 years, they'll be commonplace. There's a concept car released by Mercedes-Benz at the Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, and it literally has four chairs sitting around a conference table. There's no driver because you don't need it. The car talks to the road, it talks to the gas stations, it talks to the road signs. The car gets you from here to there without any human interaction. But let's talk about pilotless drones that deliver goods. What does that do to the UPS network? When you can have a drone drop a box off right at your doorstep within an hour of you ordering it. They're already trying just-in-time delivery in New York with, I think it's Amazon.com, is working on within-the-hour delivery. Well, that's going to compete increasingly with bricks and mortar stores, so that will be a huge change in the way retail sales are made. It's not bad, this can be scary, but I will tell you once again, this is about opportunity. And finally, if we look at, uh, or continue, I should say, into education, as I said, I've preached time and time again about the need to educate a population because technologies are rapidly going to isolate the uneducated. This barbell economy is a natural outgrowth of this. Well, with that, one of the problems with education is cost. Anyone with college-age kids knows that a private college now is around 50,000 a year. A state university is around 30,000 a year. These are big numbers. Well, technology is driving the cost of education straight down. The Massachusetts Institute of Technology now offers all of its master's programs online. By distributing that information online, you significantly reduce the cost of it. So what's going to happen in the next 10 years is education as a percent of people's incomes will drop down precipitously. 
notwithstanding this proposal for free education, which I don't believe in because I've yet to find something that's free. But as cost comes down, more and more people will engage in it. And that's the goal. In fact, the United Nations now sponsors a program to educate kids in Africa using what is effectively a homeschool technique and computerized schooling. Think about this. As we bring the world up to middle class standard, what opportunities does that create for an American investor? Enormous. And then we talked about, in, um, we talked about energy and the fact that from 1965 to 1995, we saw such a drop in food prices. And I think we're going to see the same thing in energy prices. I mentioned earlier, I think the Iranians are a little aggressive, seeing that oil could go to $25 a barrel in the near term. I don't think it will. But even today, at $2 a gallon, if you look at it on an inflation-adjusted basis, gasoline is pretty cheap. I think we could see with the advent of solar technology over the next 20 years, we don't have the ability now to use it. I get that. But it is rapidly developing. Battery technology to store that energy is developing. Nuclear power is being used all over the world. France now is mostly nuclear. As we develop more efficient ways to use resources, and that's a natural outgrowth of technology, we're going to have plentiful sources for energy without anywhere near the cost that we currently have. Again, that for the energy industry is transformational, but for your life it is because it will free up money you have to spend. And that's important, a little bit unrelated to energy, but talking about why these technologies matter. You know, we're extending life expectancy. If you go back to 1945, the life expectancy was 65, 70, and we've kind of inched it up now where for my age group, it's in the mid 80s. For people born today, on average, it's in the 90s. But you know, they're now saying the first person to live to 150 has already been born. When we can 3D print new organs for you at no cost, then the idea of a heart transplant, a liver transplant, those will become commonplace occurrences. The fact is, small surgeries like that will be automated. We're not there today. It's in progress, though, and we will be there before most people know it. So these technologies disrupt the way we work, live, and play. But how do you make money on it? And that's what the master of money is all about. Well, let me share with you something that I want you to stay tuned to learn more about. One of the largest providers of exchange-traded funds is called iShares. This is a great big company. iShares partnered with Morningstar Research and is developing, in fact, they've got it in registration now, a new exchange-traded fund that is based on these transformative technologies. So when that ETF is actually approved and comes out into the marketplace, you can buy that ETF and you have a position in your portfolio that will specifically capture all of these technologies. What a wonderful thing! So that you could be getting in at the next floor of an Apple computer or a new semiconductor company. Let the ETF take care of the detail. But you've made a strategic play into what I think is the no-brainer growth sector for the next 10 or 20 years. So keep in tune. As soon as it's released, we'll give you the ticker symbol on it. But if you want to Google it, look under iShares, and I think they labeled it as, um, oh, it wasn't transformative technologies, exponential technologies is what they call it. So look at iShares Exponential Technologies ETF. Again, I think you'll find it to be a very interesting way to make some money on a very real transformation in the economy. Now, as we go into super stocks this week, I wanted to mention to you that we had some exciting news with super stock. We have talked here at the Master of Money for some time with our meetup group members about possibly creating a Master of Money or a Safe Society investment club. Investment clubs are all over the place. It's a very simple thing to set up for us, but we wanted to wait until we had a strategy that we could use for relatively small amounts of money. A lot of the institutional work that I do and that I work with Harvest on, for example, unless you have 100, 200, 500,000, they really don't work. But using the um, work with Superstock, we are going to launch a Safe Society Investment Club here in Illinois within a very short period of time. And we're going to allow our meetup members to become members of that investment club. 
Now, these are regulated to some extent, so I can't tomorrow open one in California, New Jersey, and everywhere else we have people watching the program, but that's coming down the road too. So stay tuned as you learn more about how that works. And super stock is going to be the driver behind the investment strategy. So with relatively small amounts of money, we think our masters of money at the meetup groups will be able to begin a real nice path to prosperity. So if you're interested, by the way, in learning more about the SAFE Investment Club, send me a note at questions at safefinancial.org. I'm excited about it, as you can tell. And I think it's a real opportunity for our members to start beginning to build some real wealth. So as always, I want to thank Ron Blake of Ron Blake Music for the music we used at the beginning of the program and Chris Yantz for writing that beautiful theme song for us at the end. I want to thank Harvest Investment Services for the wonderful support they give us and, of course, Super Stock Investor. And tonight, I want to thank Ed Berliner and the entire Newsmax team for that wonderful interview. So we thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoy the State of the Union. It's coming up next. And we look forward to seeing you next week for another edition of the Master of Money.